It's a really hard gospel today. Jesus says, Do you think that I have come to establish peace on the earth? Yeah. Yes. Like, yeah, you, Jesus, you're asking me this question. Sure. Uh, Hebrew, I mean, in Ephesians, I think it is, we'll call you the Prince of Peace. Yeah. I'm expecting you to be like a peacemaker, right? No, I tell you, but rather division. So what is, what is Christ saying? So uh, there's got to be something deeper. Before we get to the hard part, let's look at the first part. The first thing that he says in the gospel this week. I have come to set the earth on fire and how I wish it were already blazing. Now, this is going to be the key to understanding where he's getting at with this division thing. In the scripture, this, the, the image of fire um, has a, it, it, it's, it's pretty consistent, right? We see it throughout kind of the Old Testament whenever he's calling down fire to take up a sacrifice or, but in, in, in the New Testament, we hear about the fire, like the Holy Spirit, the fire, right? There's two real, like, I guess, um, two key elements of fire that we can see in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. First one is Moses. When Moses sees the bush that was on fire but not consumed. Now, think about that image. A fi- something that's on fire but not consumed. One of, my favorite, one of my favorite things about uh, seminary like that we do between Notre Dame and St. Ben's is uh, every year right around Thanksgiving, we play a, bo- a bonfire football game. We play a flag football game where the Notre Dame guys go up to St. Ben's, we play this football game, and then afterwards, we, we have a bonfire that the St. Ben's guys build. Um, it's roughly 35 feet tall usually, log cabin style, like we're burning like 25 trees when we do this thing. So the flames like 50 feet in the air, like this is a big thing, big production, but it's awesome because it's just a chance to set something on fire and hang out with your friends. So it's a really cool thing, right? Um, it's a good time. <laughs> I see a lot of guys like, yeah, it's awesome. Um, for the Andre has applications if you're looking for them. Um, but anyway, uh, so that's something that like, it's a, it's a really good community building thing though, like right, we're just hanging out with our friends. Um, but the part that I've always enjoyed is watching it like uh, watching it like ignite. We'll have maybe 15 guys or so with these torches, and it's always the seniors from St. Ben's, and they light the fire. So they shove these torches into this fire, and all of a sudden, it, it, in a few minutes, it goes from a flame no bigger than this, this little candle, to 50 feet tall. So a tiny flame like this turns into something huge in just a matter of minutes. Well, if you think about, like, think about that image, think about a bonfire and something that's being like fueling a fire that, that's, that's that big. Moses is seeing this. He's seeing these flames, but he's not seeing the bush be consumed. So it's like endless fuel. Like, I don't know about you, but if I'm walking through the woods or I'm doing something and all of a sudden I see that going on where there's a bush, I'm going to be curious. Like, I'm going to be drawn to that. I want to know what's going on there. Similarly, when we're ablaze with the Holy Spirit, we can't be ignored. Like, holiness in our world cannot be ignored. The flame cannot be ignored in darkness. That's why somebody like Pope Francis is time man of the year, and he did nothing but be Catholic and be holy. Right? Right? So that's the first time in that fire really kind of, you know, kind of like brings something out. The second time that is called to mind is like during Pentecost. This image of Pentecost where tongues as a fire are breathed on the apostles. When we were in Poland for World Youth Day, uh, Pope Francis was talking a little bit about the apostles and he was talking, like he kind of humanized the situation. If you think about this, think about Pentecost. The, the, all the disciples are in this upper room. It's locked. Now, if you think about the emotions that they've gone through in the last like week or so, they're with their friends. They, they're, they're, their teacher, their mentor, their best friend. They watch him be killed. They watch him suffer. They watch him be put into the ground. 
And then all of a sudden, a couple of them start talking about, hey, he's, uh, he's arisen. He's, he's not there anymore. The body's not there. The, the tomb is empty. So there's a lot of confusion that's going on. They know that, hey, we followed this guy. They know we want to be, we want to live what he said. But there's a fear that's got him locked in because he's the leader of the group and he's been killed. So what Jesus does, he comes into that situation and breathes this Holy Spirit on them. Breathes this fire on them. I've come to set the earth on fire and how I wish it was already blazing. Like, for these people, for these disciples, Pentecost is not just a moment. Pentecost is more than just a day whenever like, Jesus walked through a wall and put, put his breath on me. Pentecost became an identity. Pentecost became something that was much bigger than just a moment in time. It became a way of life. They became God's Pentecost people. They brought that spirit. They brought that fire out into the world. And just like that bonfire, a small flame spread. And a small flame continued to spread. And a small flame today still spreads. Through our baptism, through our confirmation, we receive that same Holy Spirit and are called to spread it. Now that sounds great. Like this mysterious sense of fire that people are attracted to. What we're called to do is going out and spread it. Now we get to the second half of the gospel. Because the thing is, is that a lot of people don't want to hear that message. A lot of people don't want to receive that Holy Spirit. A lot of people don't care about that fire. I remember when um, I was in a class and one of my teachers was talking about this, that when Pope Benedict came, I think it was like 2008, um, Pope Benedict comes to the United States and he was speaking. He was, you know, he's giving his homily at like Yankee Stadium and doing these different things. And the media was tearing him apart on both sides of the aisle. Didn't matter if you were conservative, a liberal, Democrat, Republican, didn't matter. Everyone was tearing him apart because he didn't fit into their box. He was preaching the gospel. He was preaching Catholic social teaching. He was preaching what's the, the, the good and dignity of the person. And he didn't fit into their box. So both sides were tearing him apart. It's because he was Catholic. See, right now, in our, especially in our social climate, like everybody wants to know, are you liberal or are you conservative? Are you Democrat or are you Republican? Are you red or are you blue? We're neither. We're Catholic. Do you follow this agenda or that agenda? No, I'm Catholic. I follow Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Do you, do you like this social teaching or this social teaching? No. I uphold the one, the true, the good, and the beautiful. Why? Because we're Catholic. That's what we're called to rally behind. It's not about being a Democrat. It's not about being a Republican because we don't fit into those boxes. We're Catholic. And being Catholic, you buck the system. Like if we look at the Old Testament today, Jeremiah, following God, bucks the system. Following God that is not comfortable to the people around, around us. Following God oftentimes causes division even in our own family. Jeremiah, in the first reading, he's following God. He's doing what he said. He's doing what God's asking him to. And he's preaching the word that God told him to. And he gets thrown into a well for it. The apostles, they're with Jesus. They're following. They're going out and spreading the gospel and doing great work. And all of them, except for John, are martyred. In the early church, this, in the early church in Rome, like this, this really like rebel sect in the eyes of the Roman emperor, these Christians, who are they? they who they think they are, that they're not going to praise our, our God, small g. And we, we had the opportunity last week, or a couple weeks ago, to be at the Circus Maximus, where so many of them were killed. Continue, go forward with it. If you look at somebody like Maximilian Kolbe, who was in Poland whenever the Nazi regime is rising up, whose feast day is today, like, he's in Poland and he's preaching against the genocide of the Nazis. 
he's publishing documents and like letters to every to like a mass like mass pub publication like a newspaper to people anyone that would read it saying that he's against the Nazis and he's bucking the system so he gets brought to Auschwitz and killed John Paul II preaching against and being like strongly against communism gets shot and gets <laughs> misses dying by about that much like Catholic is not something that's supposed to be comfortable. Pope Francis, when he was talking to the young people of the world, he, he, he talked about this and he, he called it couch Christianity. We don't want a Christianity that's like a big comfy couch that we just sit and in the words of my, in the words of my dad, yeah, you're on plot. Where you just sit there and you're on the couch, nice couch potato, you're not doing much, it's comfortable, I'm not really bothering anybody because I'm not moving. He said, we need to trade in a comfy couch for something like soccer cleats. Like it's time, and he's talking to the young people of the world and he's talking to each one of us. Like it's time, get off the couch, not like figuratively, right? Get off the couch, put on the cleats and get in the game. Like explicitly, he said, we don't need time for reserves. Like our faith is not something that's supposed to be relegated to this building. Our faith is not something that's supposed to be relegated to where we feel comfortable. Our faith is an identity that we put on. Through our baptism, through our confirmation, when we come to this Mass, we feed that identity. When we go to confession, we're restored in that identity. Because God becomes our all. Christianity has never been something that was supposed to be comfortable. It's never been something that has been, is supposed to be easy. We follow a God who sent his only son to die on a cross for us. The leader of, the, like the, the person that we come to meet here in Mass was sacrificed on a cross. We're called to, we're called to give everything to God. Throughout the history, many people have, have made like the ultimate sacrifice for the faith. And we may not be called to that. In fact, hopefully, uh, it doesn't get to that point. But are we willing to let go of whatever it is and everything it is that's holding us back from the Lord in our marriages, in our families? Poland, when we were in Poland, we got to follow the likes of, we got to kind of like follow in, 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 uh, in the footsteps of the likes of St. Faustina, and Maximilian Kolbe, and John Paul II, and like these good holy saints from the last hundred or so years. Like he, the letter of Hebrews talks about that being surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Like we experienced that because you had three amazing saints in the last hundred years that were kind of guiding us through this pilgrimage. It was beautiful. But it begs the question, who is it in the United States that's being called and raised up to be that kind of saint? Better question, who is it in Thibodeau, Louisiana, who's being called and raised up to live that kind of witness? Even better question, who is it in St. Thomas Aquinas Church right now who's being called to live that kind of radical life oriented to one purpose and one person only? And that's God himself. Spoiler alert, that's everyone. Every one of us are called to that kind of life. Every one of us are called in our normal day-to-day -to, -day to be that saint. To be holy in the little things. Holy in the ordinary circumstances of life. Holy in our families. Holy in our school. And holy in our, in, in our relationship with God. So as we come today to this sacrament, as we come to the sacrament of reconciliation to meet the merciful face of Christ, as we come today to meet Christ in the bread, in, in the word, let us come with that, with that disposition of openness. Let us come with that disposition of letting go of everything else for the sake of God. That way that spark, that small flame, can turn into this massive fire that no one can no one can ignore amen